Welcome to our first season of the podcast, Grow From Darkness. We are your hosts, Amanda Blackwood. And Chrysanthi Dokos from Coast to Coast. As some of our listeners know, we're both survivors of complex trauma, and it's our mission to help others experiencing similar issues. This season, we're going to be digging into trauma reactions, their long-term consequences, and how we fight back to live our best lives. This is the first episode for Santhi, and I'm really excited uh, that we're able to do this. I've been wanting to do this for a long time, but I, I, I met the perfect partner in you to be able to do this with. So oh, I'm just, I just wanted to get that out there first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, I feel exactly the same. I've been wanting to do something in this area for so long, and it's just amazing how life brings these opportunities that you just have no idea you know you just cannot even predict would happen and so it's such a an incredible opportunity and I just thank you from the bottom of my heart for being open to doing this with me oh absolutely I wouldn't have missed this opportunity I just made a best friend halfway across the world <laughs> I know isn't it amazing like I am in <laughs> Australia almost a, you know close to Antarctica and you're you know on the other side of the world in the uh, northern hemisphere is, is just yeah <laughs> blows my mind yeah it's it's such a weird feeling but also really cool I mean we're we're connected in so many ways we don't have to be physically sitting in the same room no, that's absolutely yeah. right. And it's isn't that just the beauty of modern technology that we can have these connections with people um, anywhere in the world? It's, it's one of right. the beautiful things about modern technology. Well, I heard rumour that you had people who were confused about what it was that we were going to do or how we were going to do it. But I hope when they hear this episode, uh, they're going to start to realise that we don't have to be uh, sitting down together to be friends or to be um talking about or experiencing the same things that's, absolutely not yeah that's what the whole thing is about absolutely that's right so thank you those gurus who came up with this technology <laughs> yes <laughs> computer geniuses because i sure couldn't do it <laughs> so this whole season you know we said in the intro that we're going to be talking about trauma reactions um and how we fight back against them to live our best lives. So what is a trauma reaction? Um, this is something that I've heard literally hundreds, if not thousands of times. What is a trauma reaction? How do you classify a trauma reaction? And I've seen so many definitions. Um, Chrysanthi, what do you, what would you define as a trauma reaction? I see a trauma reaction as being an emotional response to something that has been um, an invasive experience in some way, whether that's been, um, you know, physically, so in an accident, a car accident, for example, or, you know, some kind of physical abuse or sexual assault. Um, it could be the death of a, a friend or a partner or a, a family member. So there's an event that takes place and we have an emotional response to it that um, scars us in some way at that sort of really deep level within our being. That's a really good way to put it. And I think one of the things that's really important to remember for a lot of people is that whatever the trauma is, wherever it comes from, it's not always a life-threatening event. It doesn't have to come with a death consequence. But no. even then, it's still pretty broad. So uh, sometimes, yeah. sometimes to be able to really understand what a trauma reaction is, it's really important to understand what trauma is. We both have lived through several different types of trauma. Um, we've experienced things that hopefully not a lot of other people have, but yet, sadly, many people can identify with and probably do deal with trauma reactions from this. So what are some of the, the uh, trauma and PTSD related things that you have personally experienced that you've been through? Oh, wow. <laughs> well, I think it, <laughs> before we go down that track, I really think it's important people understand the different types of trauma. Like there's three main types of trauma. Do you mind if we talk about that first? 
Yes, let's do it. Yeah, so um, the first type is acute trauma. So that's just like something from a single incident, like um, somebody hit you or you've had a car accident or um, you've fallen down the side of a cliff or something, you know, something. it's just one incident that's occurred. Then there's chronic trauma, so that's the second type, and that is something that is repeated and it's prolonged and it, it lasts, you know, a long time. It could be like domestic violence or abuse or human trafficking or, you know, something like that. And then there's complex trauma, which is um, you've been exposed to a variety of different traumatic events um, and it's a very invasive and... Um, interpersonal kind of experience that, um, as I said, it, it's from multiple areas. Does that make sense? No, it does. Yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah, and I think for me personally, up until I learned what complex trauma was, I would have categorized myself as having survived co- chronic trauma. Mm. You know? Um because it was repeated, uh, prolonged abuse, like you said. But when I learned more about complex trauma, being a variety of different types of traumas, I started to realize that that definitely more describes what it was that I'd been through. While I was um, a victim of human trafficking for a while, I was also a victim of domestic violence, both as an adult and as a child. Um, I was um, select, uh, sexually assaulted and raped as a teenager. I, just all these different traumas just kind of all build up and start telling us terrible things about ourselves inside our brain. And it's definitely a complex trauma. Yeah. And I, I think you really hit the nail on the head there um, in terms of it does something to our brain and and that's, that's one of the long-term consequences. We start believing things about ourselves that just aren't true. Um, you know, we feel we're not good enough. We feel um, shame. We feel guilt when we were the victims. And, in fact, the perpetrator should be the one that feels shame or guilt or whatever. But we end up believing that we're a bad person or that we're not good enough. Um, And it destroys our sense of self. And I actually think that's probably the most um, insidious aspect um, of complex trauma and um, the long-term consequence because that sort of sets us up um, in our minds. It gives us almost like a blueprint of who we are as a human being and how we relate to other people. And that sets it up for more trauma, to be honest. Right. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And I, I, in this series, I have personally compiled a list of over 50 different trauma responses. Um, and we're going to be going into a lot of these throughout the podcast. But there's so many different things that our bodies do after being traumatized as a result of the trauma. Um, the, there's different categories each for each of the different trauma reactions too. There's physical reactions, mental, autonomical, emotional. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that the autonomical responses of our bodies, such as the beating of our heart, can be altered by trauma even when the trauma is no longer happening. I used to have these heart palpitations. Oh my gosh, mm. not even funny. Mm. <laughs> Just driving down the road, absolutely nothing triggers a trauma response from me and then there it is I feel like I'm having a heart attack at 30 years old Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I can relate to that I actually a few years back now um, I had invasive um, investigations into my heart to find out what was wrong with it wow yeah I was you know I (laughs) it was just awful (laughs) and they kept saying but we can't find exactly what's wrong but your ECG is not right um we're going to have to take you interstate and get get um get more tests done and in the end I just said no enough I was actually finding the investigative medical stuff traumatizing in itself right So, yeah. Them Uh, telling you there's something wrong, but we don't know what. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. 
And it goes back to something we were saying um, offline before about um, the medical system and and when post-traumatic stress disorder was first um, accepted as a medical term. I can't believe how recently that term was accepted. So can you just run us again through that? Um, sorry, can you repeat that? I see. A little bit. <laughs> The, the um, PTSD was um, not accepted as a medical condition or term until fairly recently. You said you were doing some research into that. Yes. Um, so for a long time, what we now refer to as PTSD was called shell shock. Uh, this was a term that was originally used by the name of, by the man, but then bleh, bleh, bleh. this was originally used. Uh, and coined by a gentleman by the name of Charles Myers in 1915 during World War I mm. because he was looking for a way to describe the soldiers who were experiencing what he called unusual symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, shell shock typically is not something that's used in psychiatric, uh, psychiatric treatment or descriptions today, but people still use it, and it's been over 100 years. So the term PTSD... Uh, was finally added to the American Psychiatric Association um, in 1980. So it took that many years, it, way too many years, for them to be able to figure out what post-traumatic stress disorder was and to be able to give it a vehicle to be able to start to helping to diagnose people. But trauma wasn't actually included in the description of PTSD until 2013. Which is just crazy. I mean, how does that work? I, I just don't understand that at all. It does not yeah. make sense to me. Um, <laughs> it was, I think I said something along the lines of um, it's taken a long time for the medical um, world to actually cap, catch up with lived experience and have an understanding of lived experience um, right. and, and connect the dots. Right. I agree. And the word trauma can mean so many different things. You know, you mentioned a, a few things earlier that it can be related to an event or an experience. Um, but a lot of people use it interchangeably these days to reference that event, but also what happens to us afterwards, the traumatic responses that our bodies have. The, it, that is also now considered trauma. It's That's an right. ongoing trauma. Yeah, so. yeah. So when they added trauma into the psychiatric uh, development in PTSD, it was expanded. They actually started to include uh, people who had witnessed in-person traumatic events that mm. happened to other people, exactly. like witnessing a violent or accident or something that ended somebody's life or put somebody else's life at risk. Exactly. Um, and, Amanda, and while it's you know, if we just pause there for one moment, I'm sorry, there is a bit of an interruption happening down here. No, you're good. Sounds like the ice cream man showed up. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have minded the ice cream man coming past, actually. No. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's summertime there. I mean, I'm sitting out here with a foot of snow in my front yard. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. See, yeah. we just don't even get that at all here, but now we're digressing. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh. so um, let's see. Oh, I don't even know what I was talking about. Something about uh, trauma. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> so, oh, yeah. So when they... Um, started to include things that people witnessed as being traumatic events and mm -hmm. stuff. That was in 2013. Mm -hmm. It was in 2015 when they made the uh, medical connection between auto, uh, autoimmune diseases like Crohn's disease mm -hmm. and severe emotional trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was also coincidentally in 2015 when I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease and nobody knew why nobody mm -hmm. could tell me how Crohn's disease existed or if it was hereditary or not mm. um, and there's so much that goes into that possibly being hereditary that was one of their things for so many years but how many times have we talked about um, generational traumas Exactly, which it's really interesting that you say it was 2015 because in 2014 
I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disorder called psoriatic arthritis. And my rheumatologist, um, you know, was asking me about my lived experience. And I, you know, gave her several examples of, you know, traumatic events in my life. And she just looked at me and she said, well, that will do it. Yeah. And I, I was just shocked because at that point in time, I, you know, I didn't know that, um, these really severe physical ailments were related to an emotional experience. And, um, and the more that I've researched into this area, the more it's just made so much sense, the, the sorts of things that my body has gone, gone through. And I've really come to understand the, the mind, body, and I'd say soul, spirit, connection. Yes, you know, we're, we're, we're one integrated being. We're not, our bodies can't be separated from our, our minds, our emotions, our perceptions and views of the world. It's all so interrelated. Right. And when we start trying to separate those things, as long as we start going to some of these other trauma reactions, like, and we'll talk about this in another episode, but dissociative identity disorder it used to be called schizophrenia. Or uh, multiple personality disorder. Sorry, not schizophrenia. So that that's one of the things that happens when we begin to disassociate from our bodies. We start to feel ourselves kind of slipping away from the rest of everything that we are. Our brain, our spirit, our soul is starting to become disconnected because of the traumas and because we can't reconcile everything that's happened. Yeah, exactly. And and I've been through that. Um, there have been some pretty dark periods in my life where I've certainly felt that, um, completely disconnected um, from other people, from my life, um, disconnected from this world. Didn't really want to be here, but the only way that I could manage was through substance abuse. Yeah. A lot of people can identify with that. I had a problem with uh alcohol mm -hmm. when i was in the middle of being trafficked mm -hmm. yeah. yeah well i remember one period in my life uh where the only thing that could keep me going is two bottles of wine every night wow mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know that's a that's a form of self-medication that is another trauma reaction <laughs> complete self-medication I mean as, I mean, this is all stuff that we're going to be covering in the in the weeks to come, and holy cow, there's a lot. <laughs> it is, and it, it's it's you know just from a purely objective pers perspective, um, for me, it's been a really interesting journey researching into this area. And one of the um, people that have really influenced my understanding is a guy called um, Gabor Mate. Have you come across him at all? I know that name. I think I have seen that name in some of my research. Yeah, he, look, he's really interesting. He's um, a Canadian physician. He's originally from Hungary and after World War II, he and his family migrated to Canada. And um, he's obviously, you know, World War II, I think he's of Jewish descent. So, you know, mm. all of that that's surrounding um, intergenerational trauma there. And after several years of researching, um, or sorry, working as a physician, he came to realise that there were some common elements with um, the kind of um, issues that his patients were coming to him with and um, their lived experience and traced it back to trauma. Wow. You know, it's... It's fascinating that you just mentioned World War II. You just sparked a memory that came up for me from some of my research. Um, so uh, it's not quite the same as generational trauma, but have you heard of historical trauma? I have, um, but I don't really have a, a sound understanding of it. So, yeah, please tell me more about it. Okay. Well, the idea of historical trauma wasn't formed until after World War II, but it was used to describe this this unusual form of residual impact on the Holocaust survivors children. So it was described in 2015, again, 2015, there's been so many movements in the last mm. 15 in 10, 15 years. Um, but it was described as a cumulative 
emotional, psychological wounding as a result of group traumatic experiences, which is transmitted across generations with, within a community. So basically in a community of trauma survivors, like a community of Holocaust survivors, the constant reference to or avoidance of talking about the trauma is felt by others, kind of like uh, tension in a room that's so thick you can cut it with a knife. It becomes this like permeating presence and it sticks to all of the people around, kind of like cigarette smoke in a Las Vegas casino. It's just, (laughs) you can't get rid of it. (laughs) You can't just wash it off at the end of the day. It's stuck. Just like cigarette smoke, secondhand smoke does permanent damage to your lungs. Mm. This, This avoidance of or constant reference to serious trauma in the background of somebody else's life can actually pass down this sense of a historical trauma to the next generation. Mm, mm. Look, I, it's, it's interesting. Um, it actually reminds me of my own lived experience with my family. My parents are both from Albania, which is a, a very small country north of Greece in Europe. And, um, that is a country that it has experienced so many invasions over the uh, centuries and there's been, oh, it's been quite a traumatic past, you know, in terms of the experiences there. And um, As a child, I remember my parents talking about living in Albania and the kinds of quite, ugly experiences that they had and and that you know that that's really embedded in my brain and I've taken that on like I felt a real empathy towards my ancestors and not just my ancestors but the whole of Albanian um, population and you know if I come across somebody who's Albanian which is very rare you know there's not many of us um I always feel an automatic empathy towards them because I know of the lived experience of that of that nation. Right. Right. But I mean you also take on that generation as a form of your identity. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's yes. where you came from. Totally. Totally. Um you know the, the, it it it's a, it was a brutal society, really brutal. Um, and there were, um, I can't think, tribal tribal warfare because the Ottomans, the Turks, um, overthrew um, Albania about four or five hundred years ago and the villages, um, there were Muslim villages, there were Christian villages, um, and that there was this sort of constant fighting and, and murdering between them. Um, it was just horrific. And, you know, this was happening right up until um, when my mother was still, a, was, was, was born. She was born in 1925. And she remembers incidents like that occurring in her lifetime, honour killings and things like that. And, you know, I've, I can feel it in my stomach now. <laughs> it's really weird, you know, my stomach is churning thinking about this because that's 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 part of my DNA. Yes. Yeah. That is exactly what historical trauma is, not even necessarily generational trauma, but it can touch on general generational trauma, but historical trauma you're taking on the trauma of that entire nation mm-hmm. in your gut. Mhm. Mhm. Yeah. And that is no easy thing. It isn't. It isn't. Um, in 1946, that country was um, overthrown by communists and the resultant effect on that, on the people is just, it, it's so hard to even understand, let alone to describe. Um, my grandfather, for example, on my dad's side, he ended up in, um, in, a, in a jail which I visited um, about 15 years ago. It was cold, it was dark, it was dank, um, and he didn't even have a bed. Oh. You know, he, was, he, he was lying on a, a stone floor for three years of his life. 
because he oh was accused God. by a neighbour of doing something or other because of, you know, just stupid stuff. But because of communism, there was a mistrust and um, people were constantly, um, I, can't, I can't think of a better term than dobbing on each other, you know, like telling right. the authorities that, you know, so-and-so did this. and um, Sounds like a witch hunt. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. It was a witch hunt, total witch hunt. And one of my aunts was killed um, in an honour killing, like she was raped. And um, then her brother actually murdered her. Because Because she she was a victim of rape. Correct. Correct. Wow. So, you know, I carry all of that. (laughs) And, um, you know, and and that's not just... That that generation, but it's like previous generations. This is this is the culture that I was born into, right? Um, right. So I really do have an affinity with what you're describing there. Yeah, I had a I think a little bit of experience with that as a kid growing up, but not much. So my dad grew up in upstate New York, mm-hmm. and from what I can understand of his childhood. Um, He was a bitter child. He had an older sister and a younger sister. And I've heard different versions of his life for many years. Mm. So I heard that his mother uh, left them and then came back for the kids when she got remarried to somebody else and then took the kids over to her new husband's home and left them there while she ran off with somebody else to another state. But I've also heard varying stories from other people. One was my uncle, who was the brother of my dad's father, Mm -hmm. who said that that grandmother um, was actually quite a remarkable person and she never would have done such a thing. Uh, She was trying to escape an extremely abusive relationship uh, from my dad's stepdad. But she didn't take her kids there and dump them off she felt that they would be safer with their real father. So she left them there and then they took that as a sense of abandonment. Mm. So there's so many different things with my dad's life that I don't know really anything about. Mm -mm. And my mother, again, a middle child grew up with one older brother, one older or one younger brother. Um, She talked about a lot of the stories about her childhood Um, most of them had undertones of abuse that I don't think she recognized. Mm -hmm. And whenever something would happen to me where, um, I would cry or get upset, uh, she would, she would usually combat that by saying something like, oh, you think this is abuse? You should have been there when I was growing up. This is nothing compared to what I've been through. And hearing that repeatedly, I think is a sense of historical trauma because, if you remember, it was described as the reference to or avoidance of talking about the trauma. Yeah, yeah. So they both had these somewhat traumatic childhoods, but they didn't talk about them at all. Mm. And all it did was build up that tension and cause us to fear what it was that they had lived through and to feel this great distance between us and their families. Mm. I didn't know my grandparents really at any point when I was a kid growing up, there were people that we would see every five years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, mm-hmm. I think we, we both hit on both of those, either the constant reference to, or the voidance of mm. talking about the historical trauma. Yeah. Yeah. Interestingly in my family, my father would talk a lot about it. My mother never spoke of it. Wow. Wow. Which one do you think had a bigger impact on you? <sighs> That's a really good question. I think I've had lots of, with my mother, because I didn't know, it was hard to understand her interactions with me um, as a child. Like she was very emotionally distant Um Whereas with my dad, it was like I was experiencing things vicariously through him with his stories. So I think they both had a huge impact but in different ways. Well, and you just touched on another form of trauma. Um, Have you heard of secondary trauma? Yes. Okay. (laughs) Which you are 
way far advanced. Most people are not familiar with this term. They have no idea what secondary trauma is. Mm. Um, since you're familiar with it, can you give us kind of a rundown of what that, what it sounds like, what it means? Well, I think it's that example that I just used about my dad um, in terms of him telling me stories of his childhood and his father and the abuse that he experienced from his father. My, my grandfather was an alcoholic and very violent um, and my dad would often tell us stories of, of how he was growing up and um, things going on for him and very explicit about the abuse that he experienced. Um, and then, you know, that would come on to me. I, I would feel his pain. So that's my understanding of secondary trauma. When you were a kid, I mean, one of the greatest tools that a child has is the imagination. Did you find yourself starting to visualize the events that he was describing? Oh, yes. Very much so. And I also used to have uh, repeated nightmares. Oh, yeah. So those thoughts, those mental images that he was giving you eventually began to start tricking your brain into thinking that you were actually a witness to it or you mm -hmm. actually experienced it yourself, which is where those nightmares come from. Exactly. Exactly. So, And from what I understand, this is very common among therapists and um, the go-to person in a friend's group who hears what everybody else is complaining about. Mm -hmm. It's called a compassion fatigue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's some pretty serious stuff. Um, I is. have a disclaimer on my uh, messenger, on my uh, public Facebook account, that if people want to talk to me about their traumas, they say there's a, a question button they can hit. Can I talk to you about my traumatic past? Mm -hmm. And the automatic response explains that this is not something that's wise to do. If you give a visual uh, a mental image to somebody of the abuse that you have your, yourself experienced, you can cause more damage than you can possibly imagine. And the mm -hmm. best thing to do is to reach out to a therapist or a mental health professional if you need to talk about explicit details. Definitely. Definitely. It's not something that you can share with a friend over a cup of coffee. Right. I mean... Talking to somebody like you about, hey, this is what's going on this week and it's been a hard week, that can, that can be okay on a certain level. But when you start getting into details, that's damaging. Mm. It, it really is. It very much is. Yeah. So maybe this is a good point um, in our conversation to perhaps think about, well, you know, how do we fight back um, around, after having experienced trauma? Absolutely. More responses. So I've been doing a lot of research on this, but I know everybody has their own different way. What have you found that helps you or has helped you the best? For me, I think the most critical thing is the acceptance that what I experienced wasn't just life. You know, not everybody experienced complex trauma in the way that I had, although there are millions of people around the world that have. It's not necessarily um, a commonplace thing. Right. And um, so I think that acceptance that I have experienced and that I needed help, that I had to reach out for that um for that extra support from a therapist to help me, you know, unpack things and understand how it's impacted on me. And, and, you know, for example, like I said earlier in the, in this podcast, how my rheumatologist said to me, oh yes, well, all that trauma that you've experienced will lead to your autoimmune disorder. Um, that to me was a wake up call. Yes. Yeah, so then it's about, managing my life in, in a way that um, puts me in a safe place but not not hiding, not avoiding, um, which is a topic that we're going to go into more depth. Um, it's about, for me, creating boundaries and being 
safe within myself, which is not something that I felt for decades. Right. No. Um, and I think if we can find that safe place within ourselves to self-care, look after ourselves, love ourselves, honour ourselves, that's our, if we can start doing that, we, we're on the path to healing. I think that's fabulous. I think there are so many people who could really uh, benefit from following in your footsteps and, and starting to accept and understand that what they've been through is not only not a normal life, but also not their fault. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I used For to me, always think, you know, what is it? why why me you know what is it about me that keeps causing these things to happen so i think you're really i think that's a very important point that you've raised and i couldn't emphasize it enough it's not us we're not right. doing it to ourselves right exactly and it might even feel like we are absolute magnets for mm. it but and that's something that we'll dig into later on too there's there's a trauma response that is mm. absolutely connected to that and I, I definitely want to explore that in depth in a future episode. Um, but that's that's a very real issue for a lot of trauma survivors. It's mm. it's my fault because I keep attracting them. Mm, mm, mm. And that's um, also the subject of a future book that I'm writing uh, about healthy boundaries. <laughs> wow. I'll so, look forward to reading that. Yes. <laughs> The things that helped me when I was dealing with everything that I've been through is, um, you know, like I said, I, I didn't deal with it for a very long time. Mm. The man who trafficked me uh, came out of the woodwork with attacks against me in 2019 that left me absolutely staggering. I couldn't breathe. All of my old trauma responses were coming back. The heart palpitations, uh, the looking over my shoulder, the paranoia, the, all of this stuff came flooding back. I was an emotional wreck. At the same time, I was trying to suppress my feelings. So I mean, mm -hmm. there were things just playing off of each mm -hmm. other. And so I started uh, seeing a therapist. Mm -hmm. I needed somebody's help. And in the therapy sessions... I was not a huge fan of my first therapist and I ended up getting a second therapist, which is perfectly okay to do because they're not going to take it personally. You have to find somebody that you're comfortable talking to. I'm up to um, number six. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's quite a bit more normal. You know, I was, I was super lucky that I found my therapist, the second one that I went to. Um, she was amazing she specifically worked with an anti-trafficking group that i was a member right. of at the time you were very very fortunate to find her yes yeah she was incredible and shout out to amy she was amazing um but when she and i were were talking in our bi-weekly uh sessions eventually i started to kind of open up and realize that i was in a safe place to be able to start exploring what it was that mm. i was feeling and finding what it was connected to mm. And then I spiraled on my own and I started digging up this world of research. And it, it wasn't even just the technical side of being able to figure out when something was classified as PTSD and how the name shell shock came to be in 1915. It was things like, what happened to me when I was four that causes me to respond this way to this particular event now? Yeah. 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 Now, that research and learning about me and learning about my roots and learning about this huge list of more than 50 trauma responses, that was the biggest help for me. That was where I grew from the darkness. That mm -hmm. was where I started to rise up and figure out, hey, this isn't a normal life. And I am not a magnet for this. I just have unhealthy boundaries and I am allowing this to happen to me. Mm -hmm. And I need to stop doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, we've had a very similar journeys, Amanda. It's quite incredible, really, um, at different stages of our lives. And, um, yeah, it, it, I think that's one of the reasons, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, we've connected because even though our traumatic experiences haven't been the same, um, excuse me, 
<coughs> what we have done is we've both been able to accept, acknowledge, or acknowledge and accept, and then really work hard at overcoming where we were. And look at us now. I mean, you've written a couple of books. I've written a book. You've done a podcast for the last three years. We're doing this one together. I mean, we're, we're not allowing all that negative, ugly stuff in our past to affect who we are today and the women we're going to be tomorrow. Right. Your trauma might tell you where you've been, but it will never tell you where you're going. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that's a really positive note to end up on today. Um, what do you think? I think so. I think that that felt good. It felt like we, we accomplished something here. I hope so. And um, I do hope our listeners have learned something positive today and um, feel that, you know, they're not alone. There are so many of us out there that have experienced horrific things and we've managed to turn it around for ourselves and just like they can, just like they can. They can all grow from the darkness. Yeah. Tune in to the next episode when we start talking about the first of the trauma symptoms, denial. You can find out more about Growth From Darkness through the website www.growthfromdarkness.com. You can also learn more through the Facebook page, which can be found at facebook.com forward slash growth from darkness. Thank you.